Hello everyone, my name is Mike and welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today we're continuing having a look at historical videos. This time we're having a look at Simple History's video on the English longbow. Um, I must also say as well, before any Welsh viewers watching this as well, it should be both the English and Welsh longbowmen because the Welsh were also incredibly apt archers and most of the time they served within English armies. So their skill at bow can't be undermined. But archery is a pastime that I absolutely love, both as an Englishman, a historian and an archer myself. I, have, I own several bows, uh, ranging from recurves to horse bows. I love them. Unfortunately, not a longbow. But I, I absolutely love it. That's my plug for archery done. Um, so... I don't want to babble too much because I don't know what this video consists of. I just saw it was short and I'm pressed for time today and I just wanted to get something out for there for you guys. So, as further ado, we'll get into this. I'll fill in the gaps where I can and uh, hopefully we enjoy. Let's get into it, shall we? Men at Arms. The English Longbowman. 14th to the 16th century. Though the bow has been used in warfare for thousands of years, it was not until the 14th century with the appearance of the longbow did it become for a while the supreme and dominant force on the battlefield of Europe, especially in the hands of the English and their Welsh subjects. A particular skill were men from Wales and Cheshire, regions that became synonymous with the English longbow. The simple design consisted of a slightly curved bow made of wood that was as tall as a man and had incredible range, power, and accuracy. To use it took practice and skill, as well as great strength, as the bowstring had to be pulled back over 30 inches when firing it. Okay, yeah, so again, um, that's a common misconception when you look at media, both films and television and stuff like that, is that very often, or even fantasy settings, very often the archers are women or children, you know, like when there's a big fight scene coming up and you have the men standing there with their swords and shields and stuff like that, and they're just like, oh, well... What can we give the women so they can help? And they give them a bow, and it's just like, well, no, <laughs> because in order to use a proper war bow, a self bow, a a long bow, it required immense strength. In, uh, contrary to popular belief, you know, a lot of archers were stocky, thick men, you know, with incredible, incredible strength. These war bows that you're talking about, not only did you have to draw it thirty inches. But talking about 150 pounds draw weight, but that's not to say it can't go even higher because these, at the end of the day, these are tools designed to kill people, and so they are going to require immense amount of strength to do so. And so it's a little pet peeve of mine when you're looking at a popular film or television series. They just they hand a bow to a child or a slenderly made woman as a way that she can help. When in fact, just just give them a melee weapon. They'll probably do better. Um, but yes, the bow made out of wood, primarily yew. Yew is the best type of wood for longbows, so much so that there was actually a shortage in England and European-wide for a small at a time, uh, due to how much we were used the yew. So much so that it nearly actually also went extinct in this country, the yew tree, which is why it's now um, protected and why we had to move to things like ash and stuff. But yew was primarily because a good longbow has both hardwood and softwood to give it that flexibility that's like kind of springiness um but also that strength to kind of contain that power without completely disintegrating but in lack of you there was also ash made from them but also a little fun fact for you as well a series of english kings as well uh levied attacks with any nation that wanted to trade with england so there are reports of edward the fourth if I remember correctly, yes, Edward the Fourth had a levy of four U bow staves. So, in order to trade with England during Edward the Fourth's reign, uh, certain goods, I think it was from Italy, if I remember correctly, for Italian merchants wishing to trade in England, for every ton of goods that they wanted to trade, they had to provide four U bow staves. And this would be carried on via a series of English kings like Richard the Third, from my memory as well. A imposed a similar tariff on Malmody wine, I think, or some sort of wine uh, shipment. And this was raised to 10. So for every butt, I think, of wine that they would sell, they had to then uh, provide 10 U staves. So essentially, it's a very good political and economical game, is that you want to trade with England, then not only are you giving us your economic revenue, but you're also providing us with arms should a war happen, which is quite an interesting and you know relatively smart way to do your business i suppose but 
That's another little, just little fun fact for you. They were made from a single piece of yew tree branch. It took months or even years to produce one as it had to be dried and then worked into the correct shape slowly over time. Cheaper versions of the longbow were also crafted, but were made from inferior materials and were therefore much faster to construct. But they tended to quickly distort, which caused them to become inaccurate, and they swiftly broke apart. Most of the time, English archers were not operating as a soldier, so they used their longbows to hunt with and provide food for their family. Most saw it as a wise investment to buy the best quality longbow that they could find. The longbow needed extensive training to use, and this was part of the reason it was not widely adopted across Europe. But England recognized the true value of the weapon, passing laws encouraging regular archery practice, and even put in place taxation to help with the funding of the special wood needed to make them. So that taxation is similar to what I said with the tariffs. But also, special laws in place. There was laws in England that uh, you could play no other game or activity on a Sunday other than practice with your bow. So that was no no form of sport, no really form of kind of recreational activities as we would know other than practice your archery. And, you know, boys done this practically from the age of seven. From the age of seven upwards, they would train for hours upon hours should they need to be called up to military service so that if they would do they could use their bow and certainly towards well inside the hundred years war the composition of archers within english armies rose dramatically um i'm trying to remember from memory as it stands but towards the kind of beginning of the hundred years war period you had about maybe the army was made up of about two-fifths archers and then there's estimates that put it as towards the latter end of the kind of what we know as the medieval period or the hundred years war in some circumstances this could be as high as three fifths made up primarily by archers which speaks alone of its uses um you know some critics or not critics some commentators have called it the machine gun of the middle ages for good reason but it did take years to practice which is why it wasn't adopted this is why you see european uh, armies more consistently use the crossbow because the crossbow is a much simpler weapon you can hand it to somebody and they can get fairly accurate with a crossbow whereas it takes years upon years of dedication to use bows but they both have their drawbacks pardon the pun uh, which i wonder if this video will come on to show the importance the english placed on the military value of the longbow at its peak during the medieval era it was typical that an english army would be made up of over half its number in longbowmen the longbow was accurate up to about 250 feet, but in good conditions and fired by experienced archers, an arrow could reach a range of nearly 1,000 feet, though accuracy was only effective if fired en masse at these kinds of distances. When used in a large formation of rank upon rank of longbowmen, they could be a devastating and effective force, as proved at Crecy in 1346 and again at Agincourt in 1415 where both times the English heavily defeated the French by firing massive volleys of arrows in coordinated unison. So Cressy and Agincourt, some of the most well-known battles of the Hundred Years' War, particularly if you're English like myself, um, you know, Agincourt, Henry V, uh, you know, this kind of underdog story. You know, I mean, Shakespeare even wrote, you know, Henry V put a huge emphasis on Agincourt. Um, and for me to talk about them now would just go on to rambling so i may well have a look around and see if there are standalone videos that talk about cressy and agincourt because i absolutely adore those battles and tactics but either way what you basically just need to know is that in both of those battles the, the longbow were pivotal um particularly over the opposition that they were facing and again as i said the longbow's role obviously if you are lightly armored the longbow can do tremendous damage to you uh, there's this misconception as well within popular media that bows would penetrate steel armor and stuff like that that wouldn't necessarily be the case because it's you have shields and steel and if bows penetrated armor that easy people wouldn't wear that much armor um, however what they would certainly do is they would kill horses they would break down charges because at the end of the day you're still being hit with something incredibly powerful and so it'd throw people off it would throw riders from their horses it would kill horses disrupt charges and the kind of traumatic kind of almost uh psychological impact you know there are some dates again it's hard to say whether they're truthful or not or whether it's propaganda or not but there are some records to suggest that things like agincourt and stuff like that the french knights when they charged 
rode with their helmets looking down, so scared were they that the English might be able to put a arrow through their eye slit in their helmet. Of course, that is more likely propaganda than factual accuracy, but it's there for a reason. You know, even propaganda has its basis in truth somewhere. It was found that the best tactic suited to using these kinds of archers was to deploy them in large groups and use them like artillery, pounding the advancing enemy with wave after wave of arrows raining down on them from high above. In some situations, longbowmen were able to fire between three to six arrows per minute and were often given between 60 and 72 arrows for the duration of the battle. However, this would require a large level of physical exertion and archers would rarely attempt this firing rate. In contrast, the crossbow, favored by a lot of European armies, could only fire at a fraction of this rate. Archers were vulnerable to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, as they were lightly armed and armored. To counter this, they would be placed behind a defensive line of infantry, or a natural defensive geographical feature like a slope or purpose-built ditches. At first, longbowmen were using the highly accurate but expensive broadhead arrows. Yeah. But over time, these units needed something cheaper and able to counter the trend of medieval infantry becoming better armored, especially knights. So they started to use heavy bodkin arrowheads on the shafts, which were chisel-shaped and less costly to produce, which was the medieval equivalent of an armor-piercing round. Though the plate armor that knights used was still hard to penetrate. By the 16th century, the longbow had well and truly had its day, as ever-improving muskets and cannons were now starting to dominate the battlefield. The last recorded use by actual army units was in very limited numbers in the English Civil War during the 1640s. Though in World War II, an eccentric, highly decorated British officer called Mad Jack Churchill successfully used a longbow along with a sword during combat with German soldiers. And while the longbow as a military weapon became obsolete long ago, it is still popular today for recreational use, such as for hunting and target practice. It also has a special place in English culture, being frequently mentioned in stories featuring the medieval period and being associated with English heroes such as Robin Hood. Well, it is the idea, this longbow, of the people's weapon almost, because again, it wouldn't be nobility that would necessarily be using them, it would be regular people. And so the fascination with Robin Hood, the kind of people's champion and stuff like that, is there for a reason. And the reason why I smiled when Mad Jack Churchill came up is because as an archery nerd myself, not only just a history nerd, I am familiar with Mad Jack Churchill and I know there are some videos out there about him. And so I might actually have a look at some of those because he is an incredibly interesting and eccentric character himself. But he is there and there's almost... Uh, additionally links with a British insult. Again, it's unclear where exactly it was, and it's the reverse V. So this, but the other way around, which in England, if you're where, where I'm from, is an insult. And there, again, nobody actually knows where that comes from, but there is some speculation that, due to the way that you hold a bow, that for those of you who are unfamiliar, uh, the traditional hold is that, so two fingers below the bowstring and one above it, but obviously um, a habit that some uh, some opposition armies used to do when they were fighting the English was to remove the index finger and the middle finger from English archers. And as a result, even though they came home, they wouldn't be able to use a bow properly. And so there is some speculation and some vague evidence, but not much, that the existence of that insult the reverse v as you will is a direct link back to archers facing their rivals as i have these two fingers still i'm still capable of killing you again not sure entirely if that's true or accurate when you're dealing with sources that are that old it's hard to know for certain what happened um, and of course insults like anything just kind of develop naturally um However, you know, the vague evidence is there, and nobody knows entirely for certain, and for me it is at least a plausible idea for that. Particularly with the right hand, I'm a bit weird, I'm, I'm a lefty, so I do it in my left hand. But, fire arrows that is, not swearing people. Don't do that, kids. Um, but, yeah, so that's the longbow. It's a fascination of mine, absolutely adore it, absolutely love it, and I still think it is a worthwhile part of English popular culture. I'm sorry this one necessarily wasn't so much of a history video, it was more of me just 
getting really excited over archery. Um, but uh, that's the long bow. That's the video. As I said, I apologize for the shortness of this. I'm just pressed for time a little bit, and I just wanted to get something out for you guys today. Uh, so this is what it is. I thank you ever so much for watching. Again, I really appreciate you guys engaging with myself and others in the comment section. That means a lot. Um, even the small things to help me try and grow and improve as a channel means a lot. And so, obviously, as always, the link to the original video will be in the description. And please give them a like. Please give them a subscribe. And, of course, if you have any of that left over for me, then I very much appreciate it. It helps the channel grow. Um, and as always, please, if you have any criticism or suggestions, please to put that in the comment section. I will be getting to Sabaton and potential history, but um, as I said, I'm just pressed for time a little bit, and hopefully I'll have some of those up by the end of this week. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please stay safe, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you ever so much. Bye-bye.